Josh, I think your engineering gland has a chokehold on your brain. Oh, yes, and that's the way I like it. Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. <laughs> the podcast. Fueling the design process for engineers, designers, and those who organize their books by their thickness. My name is Josh, mechanical engineer of SolidSmack.com. My name is Adam, industrial designer of CADJunkie.com. And this week, our special guest is industrial designer and writer Noel Wilson from CatapultDesign.org human-centric design creating cool products for developing countries. Noel, if you were an Australian animal, would you be a dingo, an emu, or a numbat? Uh, none of the above. I'd, I'd, I'd be a drop bear. Josh, satiate the starved neurons in our skull cavities with the nutrition of knowledge. What have you got for us this week? Uh, yes, this week's Solid Smack update is brought to you by Inforbix, product data applications for engineering and manufacturing. Find, locate, and access all your product data with their incredibly intuitive web-based search tool. Use it for free at Inforbix.com. All right. How do you solve the world's problems if you're old and have a lot of money? It's easy. You give your money to a large university. That's it. Bob and Dottie King have donated $150 million to Stanford in the effort to rid the world of global poverty. The university is known for its research and support of technologies such as the D-Light, a portable solar-powered light, the Embrace, a $25 infant incubator, and DripTech, an ultra-affordable DIY irrigation system for small plot farming. That's right. They're also getting a matching grant that will bring the fund up to $200 million not a bad chunk of change that can be reinvested in the university resources and the entire freaking world. I could use me $200 million. Money isn't the only thing fallen from the sky, though. The OLPC, or One Laptop Per Child Project, is planning tablet drops of their XO3 tablet into remote villages of developing countries. No more spam for those kids. Indeed, the Wii tablet with a $75 production price point will be filled with books for people to read, after they recovered from any concussion via the downpour of tablet tech, this lines up with the self-directed learning ideas of OLPC. And comes about after meager sales of its original laptop. Keep your head up, though, because uh, there's no word on when or where the tablets are planned to be dropped. And a sun-sucking solar firm, Poly Solar, out of the UK, is developing breakthrough technology that could affect energy use and access to the most remote parts of the world. Their transparent photovoltaic, uh, or PV, glazing technique allows a thin film on regular household or office windows without a mess of wires or massive rooftop solar panel uh, installation. With 85 to 125 watts of power generating film, the tech can be used to replace windows, integrate into small shelters or schoolhouses, providing free, clean energy to power lighting. <laughs> or tablets that fall from the sky. Ouch. And finally, as you know, we're speaking with Noel Wilson of catapultdesign.org. Noel, in a nutshell, who are you and what do you do? I'm an escaped convict with a cat addiction and a bleeding heart. <laughs> <laughs> For what? What a con. For another set of glasses. I'm an Australian industrial designer who works on products addressing basic yet urgent human needs. Yeah, the first one is, is through a set of beer glasses. Um, and the second yeah. one is <laughs> something slightly more sober. <laughs> So what do you guys think about the OLPC project at this point? I mean, it was a, it was a very big deal for a, for a little while there, sponsored by MIT, and, uh, you know, they talked a lot of big game, and it doesn't didn't really kind of just fizzled, right? So uh, what, was this destined to happen, or, you know, is this just one iteration in, in a process that will eventually succeed? To me, it's a good idea with uh, great intentions, but I think the, the, the technology and the hardware development is just a... A huge development cycle and uh, cost to it. It's just not uh, feasible right now. No, I'm I'm curious because I'm, I'm curious what you think about this, Noel, because uh, you're a big proponent of bicycles and just basic technology for um, for the developing world or the so-called developing world. And uh, you know, is a laptop even a relevant thing in in these areas? I think high tech gadgets are, are, are pretty cool too. But I, I think that the, the mobile phone. Um, Versus the OLPC, it just it's it just um, can't be beat. Hmm. Like it's uh, it's already there, and it uh, it already carries out some of the function. Um, the only thing that it does do is it replies it re no, it relies upon a, a a provider, whereas the OLPC has a an autonomous uh, wireless network, which I think is pretty cool. So I think that when when those two are married together, then then yeah, 
then maybe um, we'll have something that's actually appropriate. But but um, I, I think it's great. I think it's it's fantastic that they're iterating it. Uh, I think the first take was a bit of a flop, but I, I think that that uh, eventually they they'll they'll come to a, a great solution. But is it too late? I mean, at this point, you know, in the Western world, we're talking about uh, about the laptop being on its way out, just like the desktop was five or ten years ago. You know, because we're moving to tablets and mobile phones. Um, yeah, that's why they're talking about those uh, doing those tablets. It's uh, the XO3 is actually a tablet, and that's the one that they're going to be dropping on those people. So I mean, that's that they're, they're they're going that direction too. But I I'm thinking, is it even? I mean, just dropping uh, technology on people and expecting them to use it. I mean, is that is that a, a realistic expectation? Even, I mean, that's sort of how where the the laptop failed. Yeah, I um I don't think it failed there. I think it it was just a uh, it started too big. It didn't let itself grow. It was it was scaled before it was proven. So and before it was prototyped enough to, to prove its point. And I think the same goes for the for the tablet. Really, like it, it should be prototyped and piloted as much as possible for it, before it goes to scale. And and sometimes things go to scale just because they've generated enough hype, right? And they haven't proven themselves in the market. Kind so, of overhyped and underdeveloped. So, no, what uh, what high end technologies have you seen? I, I guess not really high end, but uh, what what uh, um, high end tech would have you seen being used mostly in in these parts of the world in, in remote villages and, and whatnot? Are they using mostly cell phones and mobile phones or is there a desire there to or an interest in, in computers and laptops? Definitely an interest in computers. I, I taught computing for about a year in Malawi and they, um, there, was, there was a real thirst to understand what, what it is and, and how, how it works for, for people who hadn't used it before. There was a lot of people who have and do use computing for their daily, uh, daily tasks and for their career. Um, but there's a lot of people who haven't had access to computers. And and um and it was a lot of fun teaching people and but whether or not they're actually incredibly useful in their day to day um, dealings it, it depends very much on the individual and and their and their role and what they would like to achieve but but I think that that in terms of access to knowledge and education I think it, it has a fantastic potential to improve the quality of of that access to knowledge and um, education is a, is a bit of a sensitive topic but. It depends what information people are being educated with. But I think it, it will definitely uh, open up the, the, the capacity of, of education institutions to, to do a better job of educating. Very good. Very nice. Well, that's all we have time for. But to everybody out there listening, if you know about something flipping sweet we didn't mention, we want to know about it. Drop us a note at tips at solidsmag.com or uh, show us some love in the comments. You know what I'm talking about. Adam, if I didn't know better, I think that you were looking fabulous in that gravy suit. Yes, I am. Welcome to Cat Junkie Q&A. Weekly product design tips, tricks, and training. My name is Adam in the gravy suit. And my name is Josh. And this week, our special guest is industrial designer, writer, and SolidWorks user Noel Wilson from (laughs) catapultdesign.org. Specializing uh, in human-centered design to make life a better place for the global majority. Mm -hmm. No, if you could cause any part of your body to glow in the dark at will by eating nothing but white rice for an entire year, would you do it? No. (laughs) Brown rice, maybe. Okay. And and then I think I'd choose choose my hair. Your hair would glow in the dark? (laughs) This week's yeah. Cat Junkie Q&A is brought to you by Geomagic 2012. Make it real with Geomagic 2012. Bring physical objects into 3D for design, engineering, and inspection. This just came out today, and you're going to want to check out the latest products over at geomagic.com. And uh, you might want to put on a shower cap before you do that, because otherwise your brain might explode all over your keyboard. Just a little heads up, but anyway. Adam, the inside of our ear holes have an itch that can only be scratched with the Q-tip of knowledge. What have you got for us this week? Noel Wilson, when we met at uh, SolidWorks uh, at the, the SolidWorks 2012 re- uh, launch, uh, we started talking about uh, the new SolidWorks costing features and the uh, SolidWorks as well as the SolidWorks sustainability. Um, have you made use of these at all in your own work? I mean, it has to be interesting to you given the uh, the work that you do. They're definitely interesting, but um, I have not had a a project that has um, allowed me to use them specifically. Uh, but I, I do love using SolidWorks and it's, it's uh, a fantastic tool and, and SolidWorks have been good enough to, to allow our .org to use it from pro bono, which is pretty amazing. 
I'm kind of interested in uh, in how you see the uh, the bicycle and and things that aren't so so related to high end technology. How is that affect? So I, I took advantage of uh, 3D Content Central. Um, I was I was using a a bicycle off of there that was was pretty much a terrible design, but I I used it to um to flesh out a bicycle that I needed to use to create some training documents, uh, like like training visuals for for uh, people learning to maintain bicycles in very basic manner in Malawi. So we, we have um, like 500 packs of these cards out there at the moment. But anyway, I created a bicycle on SolidWorks and um, that's probably the most complex model I've had to create but with all the moving parts and it's one of the, uh, the old school bicycles with the rod brakes that you see all over Eastern Africa and, um, and other parts of the world, like old school, like 1930s bicycle, huh. essentially. Wow. And it was, yeah, probably the most intense uh, uh, works assembly I ever had to do. And that was all that was all just for just for illustration purposes for for creating exploded views and stuff like that. Absolutely. Huh. And it wasn't. I mean, I I guess uh, pardon my ignorance, but why why wouldn't it be just as easy to illustrate it more or less by hand? I mean, it, or, uh, or with a real bike. Well, yeah, either with a real Instant. bike or with with um, you know drawings or. Consistency of, of image and quality of, uh, of, of illustration as well and ability to, to adjust the illustration because the idea is we have 400 packs of these out there and we're going to iterate straight after this and change it all. So the ability to, to change the, the illustration significantly um, with uh, CAD is just in, in incredible compared to having to redraw it by hand. Yeah, that's kind of a fantastic, that's a really interesting topic, this idea that you're using sophisticated 3D tools as a 2D illustration tool, ultimately. Absolutely. As a communication tool. And, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I may have missed the context here, but what, what's the application and how is this being used after? words to, to create these iterations? So, so people um, are getting trained in how to re maintain their, their bicycles in a very basic manner, but um, just to, to, be, to be able to take things apart and put them back together. And pe these people are, are sometimes being given bicycles. Um, they might be healthcare volunteers that, that receive bicycles, or they might be part of a supply chain that gets the bicycles. And um, the, 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 the illustrations are just a... Uh, a device to be used within the training. They're not a training within themselves. And they are to help illustrate and prompt and remind people of the different things they're taught in the training. And people receive a toolkit in the training as well. And they, um, they receive this, this deck of cards that are not only for them to be able to use, people that they that have contact with can also, they can help diffuse the knowledge back through their, their network as well. And then it's designed not just to be a manual, but to be out and to be used and not be stored away in a bookshelf. And this is this is to teach people how to use and maintain bicycles. Yeah, it is. It is to not not generally to use. It's it's more to uh, basically maintain. So, do you have any uh, any special insights or tips and tricks for people who would like to uh, use SolidWorks or use three D more as a two D illustration tool? Are there any things you've run into or things that that you've learned that you think would be helpful to people? Just basic things like use a template that already has your your lighting and, and um, background and all the rest set up, so you don't have to do uh, an incredibly uh, so complex set of adjustments to every file. Um, very basic sort of file maintenance stuff. So yeah, just um, are you are you outputting are you outputting line work for vector um, drawings or are you outputting um, raster images? Both. So DW um, X files and and also just yeah using the the render package that SolidWorks um, offers up, and it was, was plenty, plenty good. To all you CAD junkies out there, if you have tips and tricks you'd like to share with the world on CAD Junkie Q&A, drop a note to tips at cadjunkie.com. And if you want to send us hate mail, feel free to send it to adam at cadjunkie.com. We welcome that kind of thing. This week we're talking with Noel Wilson, industrial designer of catapultdesign.org, working for social change and empowerment uh, for the global majority. We brought him on because he's working with a completely different kind of design and engineering than most of us over here in the Western world. So, Noel, before we jump into your work with Catapult, I wanted to get a little bit of background. Where do you come from and, uh, you know, what got you started down this path? I was born in Scotland, uh, shipped off to Australia at the age of three for stealing Play-Doh. And after <laughs> years of hard labor, hard, hard labor, I was released in Adelaide. 
<laughs> and then, then one day I stumbled across a, a Buckminster Fuller book, and that, that's the end of the story. Wow. Has, has your social conscience uh, always been a motivating force in your life, or is this a relatively recent development? What, what social conscience? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm just in it for the job security. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we, we, we all contribute to the future in one way or another, you know, so. Uh, the, yeah. That's pretty profound. I mean, you, you work with Catapult Design, which is a nonprofit design firm improving the lives of uh, people without access to basic needs using thoughtful design. Um, so uh, how were you first introduced to Catapult? And uh, is it what you expected when you got into it? So um, I was sent a job description that said, is your name Noel Wilson? Are you six foot two with a limp? <laughs> um, and well, well may, maybe that's not exactly what it said, but it, it did fit my experience impeccably. And um, I ticked all the boxes and they ticked all the boxes for me. So I, I, I went for it and I was happy to learn that a, that a primarily considerate design firm did exist and even happier to get a job with them and, and to get a visa to the state. Wow. Um, they obviously they obviously didn't find my criminal record after all. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that Plato was years ago. I, I expected to I expected it to require patience, um, and it definitely has. But I, I also expected it to be rewarding, and it, and it definitely has been rewarding. Well, so well, so how long have you been there, and what has been rewarding about it? I've been here for a year, uh, exactly to the day. Wow. And um, today, happy birthday. Today, yeah, happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Happy. <laughs> Anniversary. My anniversary. All right. <laughs> and um, <laughs> in terms of being rewarding, I, I've got to stretch my skill set a lot. I've um, I, I wear, have to wear many hats here, and I, I get to uh, see a lot of different parts of uh, the the states and the culture here, and I get a lot to see a lot of different parts of other cultures around the world as well. So I have a very adventurous job that also allows me to use my skill set, which is pretty satisfying. How much do you? How much do you have to travel or get to travel or? I get to travel every month, um, and Seriously. mostly it's, it has been with the states this year. But I've also travelled to, to Africa and, and to Australia. So, so where are you primarily? What, what what's your primary uh, people group that you focus on, or is there one? You know, where, where do you where do you where where does most of your work go? Um, we focus on the, the bits of the world that have land on them. Um, and so, because we <laughs> we're advocating and demonstrating that that everyone deserves <laughs> considerate design. Um, to fit their lives and environment. Mm. And there are projects and interventions going on all over the world. And we, we think that they all deserve good design um, within them. And we're not going to turn a client down because of location, uh, even if it's in New Zealand. You know? <laughs> and we, we vet them on, in, on their integrity. <laughs> Universality of products and or other methodology depends on the problem being addressed. And it's not as black and white as everything needs to be universal uh, or everything needs to be specifically customised. There's, there's definitely a, a gray area there that depends upon the problem being addressed. So in your opinion, what's the most important project you've worked on at Catapult and uh, why do you think it'll make the world uh, better? Well, um, I've, I'm only here a year so far, but, but it's a cross between making single burner fuel efficient stoves safer and easier to use and between developing an in-home sanitation utility provision system for, for urban slums in India. Um, and neither will obviously make the world a better place, but, but they definitely have uh, the capacity to, to save some injury and frustration if and when they are implemented. Well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, point, you know, and it begs a question of, of um, you know, are, are these designs being implemented? And, you know, what, how, does, how does your role play into whether or not these things end up actually benefiting people? We can definitely um, help with implementation strategy with our clients, but, but not all of the work we do will get implemented. It's, it's like it, it sort of goes by that, that, um, that old statistic that, that 99% of things that are designed never, will never hit the ground, you know, but, but we still think that it's, it's highly valuable to be considering people within the design of everything that, that is going to go out. And so we, um, yeah, we are heavily involved in the development process more so than implementation, but we consider implementation the whole way through. And we, we expect our client to, and educate our client to, if, if they're not already doing that. Um, but yeah, so not, not all of them go through to implementation, and there's probably a good reason for that. And really quickly, you keep mentioning your clients. Who, who, who is your client? Our general client is, is an organization that is empowering an underserved population. So these might be NGOs, or, or you know, what kinds of organizations yeah. are yeah. these? Or so, Social entrepreneurs, NGOs, 
Um, even governments would be a viable client of ours. But, um, but generally, the first in the first two categories, yes. As you design for developing economies, sometimes you're working with low, uh, sometimes you're working with locations that lack basic necessities like clean water, but modern technology like cell phones are available. How does this happen, and how does the technology have a positive effect? Well, to bring it back to the, to the U.S. again, I heard a crazy statistic about the water access issues on the, the Navajo Nation here in the USA. So. So people having to travel for miles to fill up their tanks and then travel back again because the, a huge percentage of government water pumps are dysfunctional um, or government installed water pumps. Uh, the same can be said for some parts of Australia or Kenya or Spain or Chile, etc., etc. So how does this happen? Well, it's down to bad governance and bad decision making in the first place in terms of maintenance and ownership issues. And it's, it's ultimately skewed values that, that put re- resources before people. Um, and technology has always had an effect. And uh, the, uh, the hammer is a great example. It's awesome for building and awesome for demolishing, you know. So it, it's down to how you use the technology, which is, will determine the effect. Uh, and so uh, just a, a question I've always had, you know, why do um, poor populations need rich ones designing solutions for them? And is, is work being done to educate populations to improve their own living conditions? I mean, it seems like a part of your goal at Catapult has to be to make yourselves irrelevant, right? Well, poor countries have rich populations within them, and poor populations live in rich countries. Mm. And rich populations are rich because they got to write the rules, essentially. And I, I personally think that educating the wealthy would be more effective in improving the living conditions for all. And <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I've, I've never really fit into the, to the rich, rich population within my country right. um, that I've lived in. Uh, but we, we, we're advocating that design is incredibly relevant. Whether we're doing it or not is not, is not the issue. It's, it's design that is the, of value here. Uh, another aspect to this is a uh, software side of things. And pirated software, it's prevalent all over the world, but, uh, and, and also a lot in, in places that are developing. In a lot of ways, it's being used to affect positive change in people's lives. How have you seen that software companies becoming more proactive in providing software to people beyond the uh, typical student licenses? I haven't personally seen it, uh, but software companies do have a vested interest in, in having a body of users fluent in, in their use. And they have been rumored to be behind some of the peer-to-peer pirated copy, copies in the past. Um, so, you know, putting them up there and, and letting people essentially pirate them uh, yeah, to increase sure. their user base. But um, And depending on which country you're talking about as well. But so there's definitely free, free programs out there now that, that I think threaten them and the introduction of Autodesk 123D is probably a good example of, of, of that. Like they've brought out a free software, a 3D CAD software program. Uh, it, it might be quite simplified, but they're definitely trying to, to extend their market and, and bring the capacity of CAD to more people. And that, that is, is definitely um, relevant to, to developing markets as well. Um, call them to call them um, underserved or, or whatever you want to call them, but, or base of the pyramid, whatever. But there's definitely a a, a a big market there that they're paying attention to. And some, yeah. You know, so there are thousands of designers and architects out there who still use drawing boards essentially, and they don't use a computer, but are now becoming computer literate and getting access to computers. And some of them are learning CAD, uh, but I doubt it's on a licensed copy. And there are also thousands of other informal CAD students coming through globally. So I imagine whoever makes their program most accessible and usable will get the biggest slice of the pie. And yeah, so we'll be printing our own custom flip-flops in no time. <laughs> sure, and bicycles and whatever else. Well, I mean, and I'm, I'm interested in what you think of uh, the, uh, the Fab Lab project that came out of, uh, of MIT as well. Have you heard anything about that? And, and has that been of any interest to you? Absolutely, I think it's it's an amazing project, and I, I think that that uh, it's just going to keep spreading. And the, um, the 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 maker bots that replicate themselves, etc., and and the, when that model starts to polish itself, I think it will become a lot more viral in in education uh, institutions that don't have a lot of budget to create uh, access to, to other types of three D printing um, or or fabrication. And I think that that um, getting access to these types of fabrication to some education institutions is going to be incredible for them. 
and incredible for the students being able to use it. And we'll just increase the, the design capacity within a lot of countries. So, I mean, Autodesk currently offers pretty much all of their products um, for free online to basically anyone who wants them, frankly. I mean, they, they do say that it's only for the unemployed and students. But, um, I mean, in reality, the implication seems to be, and we're going to get sued for this, but it seems to be that if you're using it for commercial use, pay for it. But otherwise, you know, we want people learning the software. Do you feel like that is a model that other companies should think about adopting? Is that is that the future? You know, does that is that a necessary end? You know, to, to getting these tools available to people who need them and who wouldn't be able to afford them anyway, or should people just keep on pirating? I think there's definitely two markets. Like there's this one who's this is precise engineering and and design like this that that needs to have specific uh, comprehension of process and material and a, a much more educated approach but there's definitely a new wave of of uh i guess you would call it um less less professional uh use of cad and i think that 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 market is not being ignored by people like autodesk for that way and i think that it's definitely in the boardrooms of of other organizations that, that create cad Noel Wilson, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show with us this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Adam and Josh. Special thanks this week to Brooke over at Blue Microphones for taking such good care of us. Uh, The quality of customer service at Blue is refreshing. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. And congratulations to intern Simon, who has been promoted and is now assistant editor Simon. Great work, buddy. Very good. We'd also like to thank our mom, Santa Claus, and the creepy guy sitting in the corner at the honeypot for inspiring us this week. We'll see you next week. And remember that without designers, engineers would live, die, and be buried in indestructible, boring black boxes. And without engineers, designers would do a lot less living and a lot more dying due to equipment failures.